I have to confess that I did not expect my little five minute video on my findings of the outcomes by playing around with the arrangements of the usages of the blur exterminator, noise exterminator, and star exterminator applications to raise such an uproar. A lot of persons seem to like the video, some persons even seem to be offended by it. Which was odd, as if I was breaking from the gospel of Russell, you know, the creator of the exterminators, when Russell himself notes on his own website that he doesn't like to recommend a specific order in which to use the exterminators. The best order changes on a case-by-case -case basis, and experimentation and changes in technology can yield new and better ways to do things. He also notes on the website in the documentation on the application of the blur exterminator using the new AI version 4 that it's best to run the blur exterminator before noise exterminator to get the most accurate deconvolution. He also notes that running noise exterminator first will give you sharper images. So you have to ask yourself, are you aiming for a sharper artistic image or are you aiming for a more scientifically accurate image? Anyway, in this video on the last one, I'm aiming for as beautiful as possible. And with that in mind, it might be best to think of how I'm using the blur exterminator here as kind of like a very advanced sharpener with AI. So let's study its usage in this sense once again, this time by looking at the M78 Nebula, a complex structure with a very wide dynamic range. Please note that I generally drizzle times two all of my images, and that makes a difference in the outcome. The color of drizzled images is sometimes degraded by the color balancing processes, especially SC and R at the beginning of the process. So if you're going to try to replicate what you see me doing here, I think you'll have to drizzle your images to get roughly the same results. Unless there is something bizarre about my computer and how it's handling data, drizzling does affect color outcomes. Now, since there were so many questions and there was so much debate about the last video on the alternative exterminator method I proposed, I'm going to compare and contrast my method versus a more standard developing method. And you'll have to determine for yourself which you prefer. Bear in mind here that I'm developing for artistic beauty, not science. So with that said, let's delve into this. What you see here, portrayed above, are two drizzled times two iterations of the M78 Nebula, the same image, I've just cloned them. And on the left image, we're going to process using the methodology I recommended yesterday. And on the right, we're going to process by a method more typical of the recommendations. You can draw your own conclusions based on the outcomes. But along the way, I'm going to give you my observations and opinions. So what I'm going to do first of all is color correct both these images using the exact same methodology. I'm going to run spectrophotometric color calibration first and then SCNR. Now, I suppose I should hit the brakes right here because I know already some persons are probably thinking, but one Conejero from Pix Insight said that you should not run SCNR after running SPCC. To quote one, SPCC provides the most accurate color balance achievable with current technological resources. This tool is based on scientifically designed and implemented methodologies. Once SPCC has been applied, the resulting color balance should not be altered. So when I say that I have found that this honestly doesn't hold through an actual application, I am just certain this is going to rub more people wrong. But the simple fact is I have tried that doctrine over and over. In many images, SPCC yields weak color. In other images, SPCC all by itself leaves residual green that then needs to be removed. And it either has to be removed by reducing the green on the curves tool or something like that, or running SCNR. The simple reality is I don't know a single automated tool that does everything well all the time. Which is why I like to know how to manually apply things like histogram transformations and curves transformations and other tools. I tend to shy away from scripts and like to keep it very hands-on. And I have a bad habit of testing accepted doctrine or orthodoxy about the way these images should be processed and the way we should go about things. And if I find that the accepted doctrine doesn't work as well as it's supposed to, I'm just going to report it just like I'm doing here. You're welcome to test this for yourself and see if it works for you or not. Either's good by me. But I feel that I would be doing a disservice to the astronomy and astrophotography community if I did not report the results accurately as I found them. I spent a dozen years of my life in university studying the sciences, and I've had conversations about this kind of topic with many a professor over the years. 
that if the data doesn't fit the theory, no matter how good the theory, then the theory needs to be changed, not the data. So I'm a very outcomes focused person in the way I approach things. So in any events, I find that running SPCC by itself gives good results, but also creates problems that have to be solved. And running SCNR by itself or with SPCC also gives good results, but creates problems of, it, of its own that have to be resolved. In this application, after finding residual green in the images, after running SPCC, I decided to run SCNR to clean up that green rather than diving into the curves channel and messing with the, the green channel to pull it out. SCNR is good for that, but it does result in some chromatic or color artifacts in uh, especially drizzled images. Not so much barely visible in my experience in non-drizzled images. But since I like to work with drizzled images, that's just a problem I've gotten used to handling. And the workflow that I've adopted, running Star Exterminator first, then transforming histograms and curves, and then running noise exterminator and blur exterminator has proven to be a good way to help mitigate the problems that come up with this method. But I'll tell you now, the method is fluid. If I was developing another image, I might use another methodology entirely. There is no one size fits all development method. But if you want to create your own art, sort of have your own voice through your photography, you do have to find your own way, break, the doctrine and see where that journey takes you. Think of it as forging your own path. All right, back to the task at hand. And this screen capture video is already long enough. It's about an hour and 45 minutes. So I'm just going to skip through this to where the images are both color balanced. Just note that for simplicity, I'm using the default settings on both SPCC and SCNR. Color balancing has been done, so we're going to work with the standard method first. On the right, we're going to begin by running the Blur Exterminator. I will follow that up by running the Noise Exterminator and then removing the stars. I am aware there are other variations in how to do this, but the number of permutations by which tools can be combined goes up exponentially as options are added and we could spend years on this. So this is the methodology I'm going to work by. And it follows pretty closely the standard recommendations given by Russell Cromit himself on when to run the Blur Exterminator. All right, Blur Exterminator has been run. Now I'm going to run the Noise Exterminator. I'm aware in advance this is going to irritate some of you because Russell Cromit once noted that the Noise Exterminator had been designed to work on nonlinear data and had advised using it after all stretching. I, like many other contributors to astrophotography forums, find that this is often not desirable because one ends up stretching noise as well. So in this case, I'm going to run the noise exterminator immediately after blur exterminator. And that's also because I then want to remove the stars and I want the stars to be deblurred and denoised before I remove them. I don't always do things that way, by the way. Sometimes I like the look of stars that have not had any kind of deconvolution run on them. I don't know, maybe the stars look a little better from a dark sky site like where I live. But I also feel that stars get a bum rap. It's like we want them mitigated and out of the way. Frequently, I like to emphasize their luster and beauty within an image though. All right, so denoising goes pretty quickly. As soon as it's done, I'm going to run the star exterminator. It'll be run at default settings and unscreen because the data I'm going to remove the stars from is still linear. All right, well, star exterminator running at the full version of the AI takes some time to run. So I'm going to skip to the end of that process so that we can get on to the rest of the editing. So with star exterminator coming up on completion, on the more standard version of this editing process, I'm now going to apply a histogram stretch using the histogram stretching theory that I went over two videos back. I'll link it here. Essentially on the histogram transformation tool, I'm going to drag the leftmost icon up to the beginning of the relevant data of the light curve to establish a black point and drag the middle icon to the right of the light curve, being careful to incorporate any relevant outlier data. And since I did that previous video very thoroughly explaining how to do this for yourself, I'm just going to speed through this process here. Now, the real fun begins. We're going to begin adjusting curves. And I love the curves tool. The curves tool is where art really begins to happen. 
I always begin working luminance first, then saturation, then the color channels. Though sometimes I might work the color channels first if there's an obvious need to do so. And what I aim to do here is preserve the information in the brightest and darkest areas while raising up the midtones enough to bring them out. Overall, running these fairly standard development processes with the exterminators has given us good results, so we're working from a good starting place with the curves tool here. And the editing process won't take long overall. Again, I'm going to speed through it. If you're curious about how I work with the curves tool, I have a very thorough video of that already made and time to come up on YouTube in just a few days. With the curves adjusted on the nebulosity, I have them looking where I want. I want kind of a dark and moody image, not hypersaturated, and preserving the information in the brightest and darkest regions. And now that I have that to my satisfaction, I'm going to go ahead and edit the star plate for this image. And with the star plate, I'm using the exact same theory and approach that I explained in the Mastering Histogram video two videos back. So since that's been thoroughly covered previously, I'll speed through this. But I'll say fundamentally, I eyeball this and I am just aiming to bring up the stars to what I feel is an ideal luster for the image. And that is a very subjective matter. It depends on your eye and your artistic interpretation of the image and whether or not you're aiming for artistic beauty or scientific accuracy, that's also very important. Here, I am specifically aiming to create a beautiful image. Now I'm going to composite the separated stars and the background M78 nebula back together in Affinity Photo, as I also do and also covered in previous videos. Affinity Photo is just frankly a much superior compositor compared to what you can get from PixInsight. It gives you so much power and so many options and so many ways to custom tailor how you reintegrate those stars into the image. So that's the way I do it. So the stars are composited back into this image. And honestly, that looks quite nice. I have no problem with that image. That's a beautiful image using a more typical developing approach. Now we're going to jump back into PixInsight and develop that same image, but this time using the methodology that I covered yesterday, which was exterminate stars, run your histogram transformation and your curve transformations, then run noise exterminator and blur exterminator. I know it violates the orthodoxy and that ticks some people off, but just wait till you see the outcomes and try experimenting with this yourself. Russ Croman himself says that performing these functions on different information or different hardware may well yield different results. You may well find that your own situation gives you different outcomes. So in any event, I'm going to begin by running Star Exterminator on that image. And since that's a lengthy process, I'm going to skip to the end of it. Now, with Star Exterminator Run, I'm going to process the histograms using the exact same methodology that I covered two videos back on mastering histograms. And then I'm going to use Curves Processing Theory that I learned many years ago while doing some professional study on photographic theory, and which I will go into at length in that upcoming video that will be released in a few days. And I'm going to do something with those stars too. Just bear with me, we'll get to all of it. All right, the histograms are adjusted properly, which is to say they give us a nice flat image or as flat as an image can be where we have such a huge range between brights and darks. And a flat image is ideal for working with the curves tool. I think of a flat image as rich potential, the flatter the better. All right, I'm going to jump into the curves tool now and begin adjusting curves. However, this is an iterative process and I'd apply several layers of curve transformations. However, it goes very quickly. What I do is adjust luminance first. If the image is complicated, I may simply apply the luminance and then go back and apply saturation or work with a single color channel or apply another sort of a layer of luminance adjustment. And I will keep working the image up and down, always being careful to preserve all the information so that I can transform it in the future as the conditions or circumstances of the image may require. Since I will be going through the theory behind this in depth in that upcoming video, I'm just going to speed through this here. Normally, I would try to develop each individual image to its own strengths. But here, what I'm trying to do is get the version using my method for running these processes as close as possible in luminance and color quality to the other image so that, again, we are comparing apples to apples. And in a few minutes, the whole process is done. When the curves are run, I'm going to run the noise exterminator and then the blur exterminator. Yes, it's going to bother some of you, but that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to run the noise exterminator first 
and then the blur exterminator on this image. And again, since I doubt any of us want to sit around and watch Noise and Blur Exterminator run through their processes for the next 10 or 15 minutes, I'm just going to skip through this and jump on to the next section. Now, I'm going to open up the plate with the stars that are specific to this iteration of the image and adjust their curves using the exact same methodology and theory that I used to adjust the previous star plate for the other image. But you may recall that I removed the stars before I had run Blur Exterminator, which again, I know is unconventional. However, now I'm going to run Blur Exterminator on those stars. A person commented below that he didn't know how this could work, didn't make any sense to him. Well, here's how. You can judge for yourself the results. Fact is, it works just fine. That is, if you're aiming for beauty and just using the Blur Exterminator as an advanced sharpening tool. And because I doubt anybody wants to sit around for the next, what, five or ten minutes and watch Blur Exterminator run through its processes, I'm just going to speed through this. With that done, it's time to run the histogram transformation on the star plate. And since the method I used was covered in that video two videos back, I'm going to speed through this. Now I'm going to open the image using my developing method in Affinity Photo and prepare it to be composited back with the stars. However, you may have noticed a bit of a flaw in my developing method. When Blur Exterminator was run at the end, it over brightened the brightest parts in the, we'll call them the eyes of the nebula. This is called the Casper the Friendly Ghost Nebula after all. See that right there? They're too bright, we'll lose the detail of the stars inside. Now there's an easy way to fix this. I've also saved an iteration of the same image before Blur Exterminator was run. I'm just going to superimpose the pre-blur image into the tableau. Make sure the post-blur exterminator image is the upper level, and then use the erase tool to erase out the eyes, giving us good quality brightness in the eyes in moments. And to me, this is worth this one small bit of extra work here, because look at the rest of the image. The simple reality is there is much more detail in this image and all the brights and mid-range sections. The image is just superior. It is crisper, more defined, and not overblown. Where the more standard version of development stands out is in the darker reds. However, we're going to talk about that toward the end when we make a direct visual comparison of the finished products of each developing method. Let's go ahead and composite the stars back over this image. So I just dragged the stars over the image and pick the compositing option that I like. Screen performs best for this image, I think. And finally, to help those stars show up properly, I'm just going to raise the brightness only on the star plate and just in the eyes, just to get them to show up better. So on the left and the right, we have the results of both these processing methods. The left is done with the more standard approach and the right is done using the method I recommended. The lower image is sort of a control. It's not the best control. I pulled it off Wikipedia because it's public access. There are much better control images, but they had copyrights attached, so I can't use them in this video. It's just something for us to use to look at, to compare the outcomes of the image. And I feel honestly that the lower image is hypersaturated and overprocessed, but that's an artistic call, so it's subjective, and it's a topic for another video. It still makes a good control. It at least gives us a sense of color and direction to take things. So what do we have here in the comparison of my image and the other image? And the image on the left is more contrasty. This helps bring out the dark nebulous filaments in the lower left among the red haze, and it makes the dark cloud structure to the right of the eyes stand out more. We also get nice visibility of the stars within the eyes. However, to be honest, I feel this image is over contrasted it's why the darks stand out so well against any little bit of nebulous background, even if that background is only a little bit bright. There just is not much breadth of dynamic range revealing structure within those images. And if zoomed in on, as in here, you'll see that clearly revealed where these over contrasted areas just appear simple black and gray. That's crushing. The blacks have been wiped out. Also, overall, this image is softer may be truer to the detail, but in this case, that's saying it's truer to what the telescope can't see or we don't know. So again, you have to ask yourself, are you aiming for a scientifically accurate image or are you aiming for a beautiful image? My preference is not the left image, not the one made with the standard methodology. Your preference may differ and that's okay. The right image applies the method that I recommended in my last video, which is to run star exterminator first 
then adjust your histogram and your curves, then run noise exterminator, then blur exterminator, almost the exact opposites of the accepted norm. What do we get out of that procedure? First of all, the image is not over contrasted. There is a subtler transition of dynamic range within the image. If we zoom in on the lower left haze to look at the filaments' dark structures there, we see them more as shadows. That appears to give depth, but it also lacks detail, so you have to pick which you want there. And if we zoom into the billowing dark cloud structure on the right of the eyes, we don't have hyper-contrasted transitions between gray and dark. And that's a good thing. In the very dark structures from the standard development image, dark regions are somewhat crushed, while on the right, there is a smoother transition from black into gray. This may also be a subjective measure though. Is it what you want? Uh, higher contrast tends to be more visually striking. It's like hypersaturation. At first, it's more visually striking. Upon closer inspection, it tends to be lacking. It is in the near full brightness and mid-tone ranges that the advantages of this alternative method really stand out if aiming for an artistic image. Structure is more detailed and defined. Now that's the AI working, and that's why you have to decide here if you are wanting most of all a scientifically accurate image or an artistic image. There's a place for both. You can develop one image for scientific accuracy or at least more respect of the data, and you can develop another image for framing or pure beauty or to display at a gallery or whatever you might want to do with it. Again, that's subjective and that's your call, but the reality is you're going to get more sharpness using this methodology. Let's continue to compare and contrast. On the left, using a more standard development process, higher contrast, the brights in the eyes naturally not blown out, but the sharpness is lacking, especially in the mid-luminance and upper luminance ranges, and over-contrasted with crushed blacks in the dark ranges, but greater fidelity to the original data, and it's a visually appealing image. On the right, using the methodology that I proposed in the last video, which is star extermination, histogram and curve transformation, then noise exterminator, then blur exterminator, you get smoother transition through dynamic range and little to no crushed blacks in the image. And there is also considerably improved sharpness in the mid-range and bright luminance regions. It's disadvantage where the eyes were blown out and I had to use an erasing technique to restore the eyes to a more natural brightness, though that only took a few seconds. Now, there is one other quality that we have to consider, and this next thing I'm going to bring up seems to only apply to drizzled images. Perhaps I'll do another video on this same topic using non-drizzled images. I spent a lot of time on this topic, I did not think it would be so divisive. But I have found that when running SPCC or Spectrophotometric Color Calibration and SCNR on drizzled images, it often throws in a color imbalance. I don't get that same problem on non-drizzled images. If I then process images using the more standard run blur exterminator first and then star exterminator and noise exterminator somewhere either before or after transforming histograms and curves, that color problem seems to be maintained and it's much more difficult to contain and control within the image. Whereas if I use the methodology that I've covered, star exterminator first, histogram and curves transformations, then noise and blur exterminator, the color imbalance that was introduced in drizzled images is very much neutralized. To observe this, let's use the control image below as a reference for color. The eyes in the nebula, according to this control, should have some red in them, but the eyes in the standard developed image, the image on the left, they're pretty much black and white. There's virtually no color in there, a little blue in the white nebulosity, definitely no red. Likewise, in the dark nebulous body to the right of the eyes, the part that looks like black billowing smoke with uh, stars and bits of fire in it, the stars and lights are considerably less saturated on the right. They're, they're almost white rather than orange. Whereas the stars in the right on my image have better color preservation. They are orange like they should be. There should be some orangish red in the eyebrows over the eyes, which is not there in the standard image. And in the white haze over the right eye, there should be just a hint, just a faint hint of orange. And we can see that it's just barely there. In this image, these red oranges have been washed out. And I see this time and time again when running a more standard developing process with drizzled images. There are odd color aberrations. Sometimes they're really stark. Here's the Pleiades Nebula. These are four drizzled times two instances of the same image. 
The color aberrations were introduced following the use of spectrophotometric color calibration and especially SCNR, and each image shows the order in which development was done. In the top two, where blur exterminator and noise exterminator were run early on, the color aberrations persist and perhaps were even somewhat amplified. None of the exterminators put these aberrations there, they just seemed to carry them along when they were run too early. In the lower images, where ran blur exterminator and noise exterminator after stretching and curves, the color aberrations are less severe. And in the right lower image, where I ran the noise exterminator and the blur exterminator as I recommended in the last video after stretching and curves, the aberrations are almost entirely mitigated. Here's another image that I recently produced using the methodology that I covered in the last episode. Star exterminator first, run your histograms and curves, then noise exterminator and blur exterminator. I also did a few other unorthodox things with this image. It's part of why it has this incredibly striking color. We'll go over that in a future video. But one thing I am wondering about is if some of the color aberrations I am seeing might be specific to my hardware, in particular to the GPU I'm using. It's a good, but not special GPU. It's a 3070 NVIDIA. All the drivers are up to date and Windows is up to date as well. But I think mostly the aberrations relate to running SPCC or the Spectrophotometric Color Calibration Tool and SCNR and drizzled images. That's where the color errors really first appear. And it seems to especially relate to running SCNR. So if anyone else gets a chance to run SPCC and SCNR and some Drizzle Times 2 images and you get color degradation, please let me know. I do want to make sure my system is handling imagery pretty close to where everybody else's is so I can give you good tips and good videos. If I'm seeing things nobody else is, that's not going to happen. So yeah, if you can replicate any of these findings, let me know. And if you do replicate these findings, again, what I find mitigates the color aberrations in particular is that methodology of running the star exterminator, histograms and curves, then noise and blur exterminator. I haven't figured out how or why this works yet, but it does work. Well, as always, I hope that helps. I hope you learned something. And in a few days, we'll take a really deep dive into curves, whether or not you think you can use this method. I really think you're going to enjoy that video on curves. Curves is a science and an art, and to me, it is the single most important tool in all photographic development. Talk to you then. Now get out there and shoot the sky.